Welcome back everybody, my name is Tucker and in today's video we are exploring uh, the realms of one of our favorite content machines and that is Bleach Report. There's an article over here where they are already making predictions for the 2021 NBA trade deadline and there are, let's just say, um, some interesting conclusions that they've come to in this article and that's what we're going to be talking about in today's video. But quickly, before we get started, if you enjoy content like this, then consider subscribing. I upload twice a day, every day, all throughout the NBA offseason. And we are very, very close to 100,000 subscribers. You can help us get there if you're enjoying the content. Subscribing is a great way to support the channel. You can also leave a like rating on the video. Helps me out a ton. Let's me know that you're enjoying the content and helps to get out to more people on YouTube. And you can check me out at various socials at the bottom of the screen uh, to hang out with me outside of these videos. But with that said, let's go ahead and jump into the article. And... It basically just talks about different things that Bleach Report thinks that uh, a handful of teams could explore or could look at uh, as we get closer to the NBA trade deadline, which feels like a really weird sentence to say, given the fact that all these trades and all these moves just happened. But I guess it's never too early to go ahead and take a look at some possible trade deadline stuff. And we begin with the Toronto Raptors acquiring P.J. Tucker from the Houston Rockets. Now, there's a few things uh, that this scenario would necessitate, and that is, of course, that uh, James Harden and Russell Westbrook are probably on the move in this scenario, which I've seen conflicting reports. Some places say that they're almost guaranteeing that both those guys are going to be moved not long after training camp, if not during training camp. And some places are saying, now they're going to run it back. They're going to force them to play. And if they opt not to play, then they won't get paid. So I'm not really sure how that is going to go, but Bleach Report obviously here is projecting that Harden or Westbrook or both would end up being moved. And in that case, there's no point in hanging on to P.J. Tucker. And the most specific or the most uh, you know necessary thing to talk about here would be Tucker's fit. That was a weird sentence to say with my own name there. P.J. Tucker's fit uh, there in Toronto, uh, a team that presumably wants to push to be one of the top teams in the Eastern Conference next season with big free agency plans on the horizon in 2021. And with a roster that has changed a good bit from last year and at some spots is getting older, but is still a really, really good roster. When you've got Kyle Lowry, who again is getting older, but is still a really good player. Pascal Siakam, Fred Van Fleet, fresh off of his fresh new deal. Guys like OG and Anobi ready to step up potentially next year. And then replacing some of the big guys uh, with Aaron Baines after Gasol and Ibaka both left. Adding P.J. Tucker to that group to play the combo 3-4 to knock down some shots uh, would be a really welcome addition. And I can't imagine it would take that much for Toronto to bring him in. And it's of course a situation that P.J. Tucker is familiar with as well, having been in Toronto in the past. So in a scenario in which Houston is looking to offload some of their players, I really like the scenario here for Toronto. Next up now is an interesting one, and it is a way in which the Clippers can attempt to remedy their point guard problem. It's pretty clear at this point that when you look at this roster, there is a problem at the lead guard spot and a problem that reportedly bugged Kawhi Leonard a bit throughout the year and specifically in the playoffs. The fact that he had to facilitate so much of the offense, the fact that he had so much offensive responsibility in terms of the ball handling and the perimeter creation because they simply didn't have a lead guard that could do that kind of stuff. And, and Paul George can create and things like that, but it just, it didn't have the same level of flow that those two guys wanted because they felt like they had to do so much in terms of the creation on the perimeter. So clearly they need a guard. Why don't they go out and get someone like Eric Bledsoe? Because right now, when you're looking at the point guard spot, it's Patrick Beverly, who's not an on-ball guy. It's Reggie Jackson, who I don't think they really want to be relying on. And then Lou Williams, who's not a point guard. He's more of a combo guard creation type guy. So Eric Bledsoe actually would be a pretty good fit on this roster when you're considering that he can play both ends of the floor, assuming that he can make shots. Uh, he's a good defender. And he's someone that can create a little bit on the offensive end when things are going well. Now, when things are going poorly, I, I don't trust Eric Bledsoe in any way. But maybe this is a situation that the Clippers can make work in their favor. The problem is, I don't know what the Pelicans are going to be getting out of this deal. I don't know what they would want with either Beverly uh, or Lou Williams, unless one of those guys is just being used as a shorter contract than someone like Bledsoe. And the Clippers are very, very short on young assets and or draft picks. So I'm not sure how this deal would get facilitated in terms of what part of it would benefit um, the Pelicans, but still an interesting deal to take a look at in terms of the Bledsoe uh, LA fit with Bledsoe potentially returning uh, to LA there. Next up now, we've got the Charlotte Hornets, a team that has been active this offseason going after a player that I still think can help teams. And I've been saying this for a year and a half. I think that Kevin Love is a worthy trade target if you're a team that A, or like the Hornets that have a pretty large offensive role for him that he can fill, or B, are a team that already has a high payroll that you can just take on the contract to Kevin Love anyway, because you're already going to pay, be paying a ton of money and be paying a guy to make some shots and create some offense for you uh, inside. And Kevin Love in this scenario would be going to Charlotte again. 
terms of what you know what would be going in return to Cleveland I'm not sure but I'm assuming at this point they would just take some salary cap relief and you know a, a bit of assets but really not asking that much and Charlotte would be able to pair Kevin Love Gordon Hayward arguably two of the most overpaid guys in the league but still talented players along with LaMelo Ball they ideally in this scenario would keep uh, Devontae Graham and then maybe Terry Rozier goes to Cleveland or he's still there and you're starting to build something there obviously they still have issues at the five spot PJ Washington's role in all this would be kind of weird because you kind of want to grow and develop that guy but you know Kevin Love is going to want to start maybe him and Washington start together I don't know but regardless I think it's at least an interesting scenario to take a look at for both of these teams. Charlotte clearly based off their offseason moves, both specifically going to get Gordon Hayward, they wanna push for the playoffs. They wanna be taken seriously. They wanna be a team that is pushing for that eighth seed and adding in Kevin Love for what will probably not take a lot in return would add to the legitimacy of that case and of that chase for the eighth seed. Whereas on the other hand for Cleveland, at this point, they're probably just looking for any assets they can get in exchange for Kevin Love. It was reported that when he did request a trade, that most teams around the league viewed him as a negative asset given his salary. Uh, so it probably, again, wouldn't take much for them to accept a love trade just to get out of the salary stuff, add a little bit to the core that they're building there in Cleveland. If, if the Hornets are willing to take on the salary, I actually do kind of like this deal for both sides, or at least this, the idea of it. But this is the one where um, things go a little bit wild here, Bleach Report. So they basically spell out this scenario. I'm not going to read it word for word, but they basically spell out the scenario in which the Warriors season doesn't go the way that they want it to, whether it be because of injury, whether it be because the talent just isn't there, whether it be because James Wiseman isn't as good as they hope that he will be, or Wiggins or Uber or whatever, all that stuff just doesn't go well. And they start to explore the possibility of trading away Steph Curry. And this is an issue for me because the points that are made in the article are that the Warriors don't really have a chance of being a contending team. You know, what are they really pushing towards? Is it something that makes sense for them to keep someone like Steph who's getting older and is a 2022 free agent? All that stuff, on and on and on and on and on. Is it a good idea? Is it worth it? Blah, blah, Here's my problem with, with, with that idea and that train of thought. If that was the case, and if after Clay got hurt, they just threw their hands up and they were like, you know what, maybe we should start evaluating our future. We don't know if we're going to have Clay for the next 18 months. Let's start to really think about Steph's free agency and Draymond's age and Steph's age, they never would have made the Kelly Oubre trade because the I'm telling you, like it's mind boggling how much money, not that they're going to be paying Kelly Oubre directly, but how much of a financial hit they took to bring in Kelly Oubre because of his salary, because of how it affects their luxury tax, because of how much they are hard capped out now, considering the scenario that the world is in right now and the fact that they're not going to have fans for the most part at their games next year for at least part of the season, considering all those financial things, if they really were considering the idea of just somewhere on the whiteboard saying, maybe we should think about Steph's free agency in 2022 with Draymond's age or Steph's age, they never would have even thought about the Oubre trade, but they went through with it, which tells me that this idea, this concept that they should start considering Steph's longevity and, and his free agency is kind of ridiculous to me. I'm not saying that he's going to be great. I'm not saying even that he won't fall apart and that he won't continue to get hurt. This is someone that had injury issues in the beginning of his career. But if there is a superstar game that is going to age gracefully, it's Steph Curry's. And so I don't think they're exploring any kind of trade options. I don't think they're even thinking about it. I don't think they're thinking about his 2022 free agency. He is and probably forever will be connected with that franchise. And I don't think there's any way that they let him go, even when he is 50% of himself uh, at this point. So that... That was definitely a strange one for me to read in this article. And then the last up is one that's been kind of repeated over and over and over. And it seems like Daryl Morey, um, short of just coming out publicly and saying he's not trading Ben Simmons for James Harden, that's been kind of the stance that's been laid out here by Philly. It says Rocket Sixers broker Harden for Simmons blockbuster. It, it, this feels like kind of just like not even worth talking about sometimes because the Sixers don't want to trade Simmons and the Rockets are reluctant to trade Harden and they're certainly reluctant to trade him if they're not getting Ben Simmons. So it's kind of like, the, the, there's no there's no wiggle room here. There's nowhere for either of these teams to go. There's not a package that Philadelphia can build to persuade the Rockets to trade James Harden and the Sixers are unwilling at this point to give up Ben Simmons. Now, the only reason that this would make sense is again, this is about the trade deadline. This is about as we get closer to the deadline, if things really blow up in Philly and Doc Rivers' first season for whatever reason, if if Simmons or Embiid just goes to their ownership and they're like, I can't play with this guy anymore, it doesn't work, uh, the flow of the offense just isn't right, I'm just not a fan, we've tried changing the front office, we've tried changing the personnel, we've tried changing the coaching staff, none of it works, get me out. Okay, then we can start talking about this. Uh, but I don't think as of now, 
James Harden going to Philly is a realistic possibility until they relent on the idea of trading uh, Ben Simmons to Houston. So as interesting as this would be, I don't think this is anything really worth talking about to this point. Uh, maybe as we get close to the trade timeline, it will be, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that one. But that's going to be the end of today's video, and I thank you all very much for watching. Uh, like I said, just kind of want to do something a little bit different, look at some Bleach Report stuff, uh, just kind of talk about the NBA as a whole. It's fun to do that rather than being so specific about one topic, to just kind of flow throughout different places in the league uh, and talk about everything that's going on according to Bleach Report. But like I said, that's going to be the end of today's video. I thank you all very much for watching. Once again, my name is Soccer. If you missed any of my previous videos, then be sure to check out the boxes on screen. Hope you guys have an awesome rest of your day, and I will see you all next time.